Leslie, how are you all doing? All right. Thank you for joining us. This is the first presentation for Democracy Days. It's community college. I appreciate you all coming out today. I'm happy to be here to talk to you all about the subject that I feel is very important. And this is a subject I've been interested in for a while, the way that democracy um, connects world peace and human rights. And as a supporter of democracy, obviously, this is a topic I like to have a long time interest in. And recent events, unfortunately, this is also a topic that is particularly relevant right now with the ongoing war in Ukraine. So this talk, this talk is about democracy, dictatorship, and war, and how they relate to each other. And I want to start off giving a quick definition of democracy. We should define our terms here. If I use this instead, hold on. Apparently the clip on's not working that well. Hold on. Okay, test. Is that better? Working? Okay, I was hearing a lot of echo, so thank you everybody. All right, for putting up with that. All right, so let's start off here by kind of defining our term, key term here. What is democracy? When we talk about democracy, what does that mean? And the word democracy is an ancient one. You may know that the first democracy in the world is generally considered to be the city-state of Athens, and that was about 2,500 years ago. And the word democracy, as you might expect, comes from a Greek term. Demos means people, and the root word that makes krasi is uh, government. So democracy is government of the people. That was the first real democracy in the world. After that, you had little outbursts of democracy kind of here and there around the world. Britain had an effective parliament starting in about the year 1250 that put some significant restrictions on the king's powers. But democracy, as we'll see in the talk here, didn't really become a worldwide phenomenon until the 1600s, 1700s. And democracy, generally speaking, can be defined as a government chosen by its own citizens. So this would be the opposite of dictatorship. A dictatorship is a government that is not chosen by the citizens. In dictatorships, normally you have a dictator, a single individual who welds complete and unchecked authority over that government. Related to democracy, or pardon me, related to a dictatorship could also be um, a, a small group of people who control the government. A plutocracy is the name for that. So this is the opposite of democracies. And these authoritarian dictatorships can take many forms. You can have military dictatorships. You could have fascist regimes. You could have communist regimes. Some of those still exist in the world today. It's important to note that in most cases, citizens do not directly control their government, but select the political leaders who do. So when you look at democracy and the way it actually works, true democracy, or some people might call it pure democracy or direct democracy, as they had in Athens 2,500 years ago, in that case, the people made all major decisions for government. Like if you had to make a decision on whether to raise taxes or we want to go to war with the Persian Empire or something like that, the people, the voters of Athens would have to approve that decision before it was made. Now I'm sure as you all, all know that when government wants to raise taxes today, when the government here in Missouri or at the national level wants to pass laws, they don't consult all of you, that you all don't vote on every proposed change to the law. Instead, we elect political representatives. And the idea is those representatives should reflect the will of the people and should govern on the people's behalf. So it's important to note when we talk about democracy, we're not talking about people directly controlling their government as they did in Athens, but rather electing persons who then run the government on the people's behalf. So brief history of democracy here. As I mentioned earlier, until a few hundred years ago, democratic governments were quite rare with monarchies being the norm. A monarchy is a type of you could call it a type of dictatorship that is not nearly as common in the world today as it was, say, 500 years ago. But you probably know most governments in the world up until they get to the 16 or 1700s were monarchies. Of course, the, the United States was originally created as under a monarchy with the British Empire. Uh, all through Europe and Asia, you had monarchies. How many of you have been out to Cahokia in Illinois and seen the old, the ancient city there? Some of you have. It's really, you should go and check it out sometime if you haven't. It was the largest, one of the largest cities in the world at its peak. The Cahokians did not have a written language, but it's thought that they had a royal family, essentially, a monarchy. And this is a pretty stable way to run your government at the time. 
Everybody agrees that when the king dies, the king's oldest son takes over as the new king. Just recently in Britain, the queen, uh, Queen Elizabeth II, passed away, and now her son is King Charles III. Makes for a nice smooth transition of power. But starting in the 1600s in Europe, you get this thing called the Enlightenment. And this is a philosophical movement. It impacts uh, Western culture in a lot of different ways. It advocates that you'd have a secular pursuit of science, so it's a secular, generally non-religious way of looking at the world. It's based on rationality and logic. And a lot of the Enlightenment political thinkers like John Locke and Hume, etc., they really had a couple of strong beliefs about how government should be run. Most of them favored some kind of democracy, not all. And these Enlightenment thinkers tended to believe in the idea of a social contract, that human beings behave pretty decently towards each other, even in the absence of a really strong government. You don't really need government all the time to keep people in line. Most of us are pretty socially conditioned to be decent to each other, to not physically harm each other or take each other's property. So uh, any kind of dictatorship is kind of overkill because people will do the right thing most of the time. Also, enlightenment thinkers tended to be very strong beliefs in a concept called natural rights. Natural rights is something that we don't particularly believe in. They did believe in what they call a creator some kind of creative force in the universe, and that this force grants all people basic rights. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, in the Declaration of Independence, uh, defined these as being the rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. A lot of people would put in there the possession of property as well would be an element of natural rights. So once again, you don't really need a strong dictatorship. You don't need a king or queen to run your government. The people can do it themselves pretty well, They'll do the right thing thanks to the social contract, and government has an obligation to protect the basic rights of citizens. The Enlightenment in Europe led to democratic revolutions in places like the United States and France. The French and American revolutions happened right around the same time in the late 1700s. The French Revolution was considerably more radical than what happened in the United States, but both of these were democratic revolutions that overthrew dictatorship-style governments that existed before in those countries. And despite their calls for freedom, many of these democratic states engaged in imperialism and tolerated gross human rights violations such as slavery. Now, I'm a pretty big supporter of democracy, or I hope you all are too. But that's not to say democracy is a perfect system, far from it. I mentioned uh, the city of Athens earlier, which in ancient times was the first democracy to exist in the world. When I say it was a democracy, I said, I, I said before, you know, the people who came out and vote got to control the government directly. Do you think they let everybody come out and vote in ancient Athens? No. It was men over a certain age, I believe it was 21. So men of a certain age, and they had to be free men. Despite the fact that it was a democracy, uh, Athens, like a lot of democratic republics that have existed through history, also tolerated slavery, just like the United States up until 1865. So in Athens, only free men who were only free men of a certain age could show up and vote. And at that time, almost half of Athens' population was a slave population. So with slavery, you can see that as obviously being uh, a major human rights violation that democratic governments often tolerated. So I'm not making an argument here that democracy is a perfect form of government. It's also important to note universal suffrage in many of these countries was not achieved until the early 20th century. When you look at the United States, when the United States was first founded, in, a lot, in some ways similar to Athens, only white men over the age of 21 could vote, and in a lot of states you had to own property. You may have heard that before as well. You had to own property. Renters could not vote. That limited voting in effect to kind of middle class, at least, if not upper class, white men. Progress on this was slow. African American people were theoretically given the right to vote at the end of the Civil War uh, with the passage of the 15th Amendment, but in practice, as a lot of you probably know, African American people could not vote until the 1960s when the federal government really started to enforce civil rights laws and they passed the, um, the Voting Rights Act in 1965. Women were not allowed to vote, uh, I should say white women particularly with what we just said, but women weren't allowed to vote in this country until 1920 with the passage of a constitutional amendment. So once again, democracy historically has oftentimes been limited to a small number of people and universal suffrage was slow in coming to a lot of these democracies. Now let's look at what happens with democracy 
and dictatorship around World War II. So, is that the drone? <laughs> okay, they warned me there might be a drone coming. No, not that kind of drone, it's like a camera drone, right, okay. Um, <laughs> they're gonna have to fly around and get like aerial shots of all of us, okay. So, where was I? Yeah, World War II, right. Now, this chart here you see up on the slide right now is really interesting. What this measures is the number of democratic and non-democratic states in the world. The red line is the number of dictatorships in the world at a given year. This starts in 1800 and goes through 2010. The blue line is the number of democracies, and the black line represents nations that had kind of a mix. You know, let's say uh, you maybe have democracies, but you still have some kind of constitutional monarch, or uh, a large chunk of the population is still prevented from voting, so it's definitely what you'd call like an imperfect democracy. And you can see some really interesting trends over time, right? You can see here that um, starting around World War II, you see a spike in the number of authoritarian governments in the world. That's around the time of the rise of fascism. In Europe, you have fascist regimes coming to power in Europe. You also have the Soviet Revolution. Then after World War II, you see another big spike in authoritarian governments, although at the same time, you see a spike in the number of democratic governments in the world. What happens at the end of World War II is the Soviet Union takes over Eastern Europe and sets up puppet regimes in countries like Poland, Czechoslovakia, Yugoslavia, etc. And you also have communist revolutions spreading around the world in countries like, say, North Korea or Vietnam that also put dictatorial communist governments in effect. But you also see at the end of World War II a real increase in the number of democratic governments competing with them. After World War II, colonialism starts to end around the world. The European powers that held colonies, mostly in Africa and Asia, begin to grant them independence, and most of these countries become democracies. Then you go up to about 1991, you can see there were uh, dictatorships kind of peak uh, around the year 1980. In the late 1980s, the Soviet Union and its satellite nations in Eastern Europe, their governments all collapsed and they replaced entirely with democratic regimes. So you see the number of dictatorships really drop off and the number of democracies really increase in the world. So you see some real historical changes with this. So we talked about the fall of communism. Um, around, as a result of all of this, in the early 1990s, and I remember this, there was this real feeling among some political scientists that we might have reached what one author called the end of history. Francis Fuki, Fukuyama wrote that book. I read it when I was in college, when I was your guy's age. And this book held that clearly capitalism is the best economic system. We're all basically gonna be capitalist nations from now on. And democracy clearly seems to be the best way to run your government. So we don't really need to worry about dictatorship anymore. He acknowledged that like Islamic fundamentalism was still a threat to democracy in some parts of the world, but generally we're gonna be a democratic world and a capitalist world from now on. Hence the, the idea of the end of history. You're not gonna see big world wars anymore. You're not gonna see big conflicts between democratic states and dictatorships. Now these predictions were overly optimistic, shall we say. The number of democratic nations in the world has dropped over the last 15 years. There are several countries in the world that were listed as democracies, say, 20 years ago, that today are not. A good example would be Russia. And Russia was always kind of a flawed democracy. Corruption in government was always a, a big problem in Russia. But under Boris Yeltsin, who took over as president of Russia after the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991, under Boris Yeltsin, Russia could fairly be called a democracy. There were multiple political parties competing. They had what looked like fairly free elections in that country. But as a lot of you probably know, when Vladimir Putin came in uh, as the new president of Russia in, that was in the year 2000, he rapidly started gaining more power for himself. Some of you may know that uh, Vladimir Putin is a former KGB agent. He was with the Soviet secret police. Uh, he's rapidly becoming one of my least favorite people in the world. Um, but Vladimir Putin started amassing more and more power to himself, whereas today you cannot call Russia a democracy in any sense of the term. And there's been some real black backsliding among other democratic uh, governments in Europe. Just a couple of days ago, the European Union threatened to withhold billions of dollars in financial aid to the nation of Hungary 
because Hungary is rapidly becoming an authoritarian state under their essentially dictator at that point, and democratic norms are really breaking down there. There are some other countries like Poland where democracy seems to be kind of hanging on by a thread. So the number of democratic nations has decreased in the world over the last 15 years, and in democratic nations, a lot of these democratic norms have been undermined. In India, there's currently a nationalist Hindu party that runs the government. And uh, all, uh, there's been a lot of claims that they're really oppressing the rights of the Muslim uh, minority living in India. They're becoming less democratic over time. Here in the United States, right, there's been a real decline in democratic norms and democratic values in recent years. And I think some of the other talks here for Democracy Days are going to cover some of what's going on here in the U.S., so I'm not going to dwell on that a whole lot. But it is deeply troubling to me that there are more and more politicians in this country who when they lose an election say, well, it must be vote fraud, right? That must explain why I lost. The ability to accept losing is a key to having a democratic government. You don't win all the elections. I tell my, I tell my liberal friends, I'm a liberal, that shouldn't be terribly surprising if you know anything about college professors. But I tell my liberal friends, listen, we're not gonna win all the time. That's not how democracy works. Sometimes you win the election, sometimes you lose them. But the ability to accept losing is a key to having a functioning democratic government. I think that's really being undermined at this country in this point. Of course, more restrictions being placed on who can vote and where and when they can vote are also problems right now in the United States. And it really troubles me in that some politicians in the U.S. have recently set, been saying we should reject the term democracy as a way to describe our government. We're not a democracy, we're a republic. In a very, very technical sense, they have a point. The U.S. Constitution refers to this country as a republic, not as a democracy. What I would say is a republican form of government, one where the people directly elect their political leaders, is a form of democracy. Rejecting the term democracy, although it's symbolic, I find it deeply troubling for politicians to be doing that in our country today. And this decline in democracy in recent years in the world can be traced to several factors. This map, I got this online, this is from the World Democracy Index that measures democratic trends around the world. And you can see on this, what, let me explain this. What this depicts is how democratic a nation is. The deeper color green it is, the more democratic the nation is. The deeper color red it is, that's the least democratic nations. So you can see, democracy has done pretty well in the Americas. Just about every country in the Americas can be considered a democracy, except for Venezuela, Cuba, and Nicaragua, which are currently all under socialist dictatorships right now. There are some other countries you can see there, such as Bolivia, Mexico, um, El Salvador, Honduras, that have some real problems. They're flawed democratic states, but still democracies. So democracy has really flourished quite a lot in the United States, uh, to a large extent as the result of America's influence in the region. But you look at Asia, Africa, you tend to see a lot more dictatorships in that part of the world. So why has there been so much back? Oh, I should point out quickly also, notice according to the World Democracy Index, um, America is a democracy, but not necessarily an absolutely great one. It's kind of that lighter shade of green, right? Compared to say like Canada or the, or the um, Scandinavian countries, Australia, New Zealand. So there's several reasons that you see democracy backsliding in the world today and you see more dictatorships emerging. You can point to things like political corruption. Truth is democracy is not the most efficient way to run your government. It takes forever to make decisions. It takes forever to pass laws. Winston Churchill, he was the prime minister of Britain during World War II. He had a famous quote where he said, democracy is probably the worst way you could ever run your government except for all the other ways. You get what he was saying there, right? That democracy is not a great way to run your government. It's not very efficient, but the alternatives are all worse. So you probably ought to stick with democracy. That's kind of my view of it as well. I don't say democracy is a perfect system. Like I said, it can take really a long time to pass legislation. Sometimes the elected leaders are not, in fact, very responsive to the views of the voter. And in some democratic nations, you had a real problem with corruption. Uh, Benito Mussolini was the fascist dictator of Italy. And they said the one good thing you'd say about uh, fascist Italy was the trains ran on time. That's what they said at the time. The idea was that the Italian government was so inefficient and corrupt before that, you know, you never knew when the trains were going to show up. Hey, when the fascists took over, at least the trains run on time. 
Get the idea? There are some advantages to that. And when you have a deeply corrupt democratic regime, it almost looks appealing at some point for some, especially some general who's very popular to come in and say, hey, I'm going to take over. I'm going to make decisions in government. Stuff's going to get done. The trains will run on time. Get the idea? So political corruption can be a real uh, weakness in democracies. Xenophobia and fear of social change. Xenophobia means fear of outsiders, and that's pretty closely related to fear of societal change. When you look at these dictatorships that are emerging in Europe, particularly, a lot of them seem to be anti-immigrant movements. The idea is that immigrants are coming into our country and kind of changing our culture and maybe in a way destroying our way of life, right? So we need to make sure we keep all of the immigrants out. Just uh, recently in Sweden this week, they had elections where the far right party, this was a party originally founded by a bunch of neo-Nazis. They got 20% of the vote in the Swedish elections and their main running point was zero immigration to Sweden, full stop. Get the idea, we will not allow anybody to immigrate to our country under any circumstances anymore. And at least for about one fifth of Swedish voters, that seems to be an appealing message, right? And I'm one who favors a multicultural society. I don't subscribe to these beliefs myself, but they do seem to resonate with a large chunk of the population worldwide, not just in, here in the United States where you can see anti-immigrant stuff going on, but worldwide. A lot of people seem to fear big waves of immigration. And one thing dictatorships can do is say, no more of this free immigration stuff, uh, Russia for Russians, or America for Americans, no more immigration. And societal change. When you have, uh, a, a democracy where people are free to state their opinions and free to put even unpopular opinions forward, you're gonna see some societal change. Look what's happened in the United States with things like the civil rights movement, the gay rights movement, the ongoing trans rights movement, right? These are changing our society. And certain elements of society don't like those changes. Dictatorships, not always, but they tend to be pretty socially conservative. Um, th I mentioned the dictatorships you find in the Americas, Cuba, Venezuela, Nicaragua, are socialist dictatorships, so economically they're fairly left. But when you look at their social policies, they tend to be pretty conservative, right? Anti-immigrant, anti-societal change, uh, putting um, the brakes on gay rights, putting the brakes on uh, improved rights for racial minorities, etc. And here's a word you don't hear a lot, revanchist, revanchist nationalism. Revanchism is an idea that once our country was great, and if you put this dictator in charge, our country will be a great empire once again. This is Vladimir Putin, and God, he is really screwing it up. You know, are you familiar with what's going on in Ukraine, right? It's not going well for the Russian army, right? Um, they're, they're getting beaten by the Ukrainians who are a country with, that has one third their population and not nearly the weaponry that Russia has. So it's not going well. But that was one of the big points of Vladimir Putin. I'm going to unite, oh by the way, have you heard this before? Vladimir Putin says there's a lot of ethnic Russians living in other parts of Europe, in Ukraine, in Moldova, in places like that, and they should be all under my direct control. So he's a dictator who's saying all people of my ethnic group should be under my direct political control. Okay, students of European history, does this sound familiar at all? Maybe. Anyway, um, so Vladimir Putin's saying, I'm going to return the Russian empire to its former greatness. You get the idea? I'm going to make Russia great again. Um, you can see this a lot of other European countries. Like uh, when Benito, Benito Mussolini came to power in Italy, he said, I'm basically going to refound the Roman Empire. Because Rome, of course, you know, the capital of Italy was the center of the Roman Empire. Once again, didn't go too well for them. They didn't really pull that off. Their empire ended up consisting of Libya and Ethiopia, essentially. Those countries were conquered, but he didn't extend his empire any further than that. But revanchist nationalism, the idea that we're going to restore the former empire, this great glorious nation that we once had before. Dictators tend to do well when they make appeals like that. Now, what are the advantages of democracy? What do you, what's so good about democracy? One, you can make a moral argument that people should just have the right to control their own government. One of the big slogans in the American Revolution was no taxation without representation. The idea is you should not be allowed to tax me unless I have a say on how this government is run. That is unfair. People have a right to um, shape their government, to uh, have a say on how taxes are going to be raised and spent. It's a moral argument. Beyond that, there are some practical advantages to democracy. And these are all reasons I support democratic governments. Better protection for human rights. 
This is from a, a, a group called uh, DIMV. It's an international organization that rates countries based on their respect for civil rights and civil liberties. And in this particular case, they're measuring things like, uh, let's see here, captures the extent which laws, and tr laws are transparent and predictably enforced. Public administration is impartial, so the government doesn't favor one, say, ethnic group over another. Citizens enjoy access to justice, secure property rights, freedom from forced labor, no slavery. Uh, physical integrity rights, you're safe in your homes, and freedom of religion, which is a big one. So you look at this chart, the darker blue countries are the freer countries by this standard. The lighter green countries are the less free ones. Now, as one argument for democracy, look at that map there, right? Okay, note where the really free countries are, and then go back to that map, okay? Look at that for a second. Look where the dark red countries are. Are you seeing it? Right? Democratic governments very much more strongly support the basic human rights of the people living there. It's not a perfect correlation. There have been some repressive democratic regimes in the past, and there have been a couple of dictatorships that were somewhat socially open. It's not a perfect correlation, but a very strong one. Democratic governments clearly protect the human rights of their citizens much more effectively and much better than dictatorships do. Also, democracies very, very rarely go to war with each other. Now, there are examples, of course, of authoritarian governments going to war with each other. That's fairly common in world history. You look at the, uh, the war between Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union during World War II. The Iran-Iraq War of the 1980s would be another example of that, authoritarian regimes going to war with each other. Also, democratic nations do sometimes go to war with authoritarian regimes. Once again, America versus imperialist Japan and Nazi Germany during the Second World War. Or more recent examples would be the United States invasion of Grenada, Panama, and later Iraq. That does happen. But democratic nations, I think public opinion tends to be against war in most democratic states. And democratic governments will always try to work out their problems with each other without, without resulting of, to war. Since the end of World War II, the only real example you can point of of a war between democratic nations would be some of the continuing hostilities between India and Pakistan. India has been a pretty solidly democratic nation since it gained independence in the late 1940s. Pakistan has kind of gone back and forth from military dictatorships to, to democratic governments and then back to military dictatorships. There have been some times in which India and Pakistan fought border wars when they were both at least allegedly democracies. That's about the only example you can really come up with. So, Democracy also seems to really engender world peace. And we can see the inherent aggression of autocratic states manifested in the recent invasion of Ukraine, which I'm sure you're all somewhat familiar with because it's obviously a big news story right now. So with this, we see once again Vladimir Putin going to war with a democratic nation. And this is one of the reasons that the democratic nations in the world have really rallied around Ukraine, which I've been gratified to see, providing Ukraine with a lot of economic and military support. They don't want to send troops in. No European nation in the United States doesn't want to do this either. They don't want to send troops into Ukraine because Russia has nuclear weapons and they're hesitant to get involved in a direct war with a nuclear armed state. Having said that, the Western nations are providing Ukraine with a lot of military, financial support, weaponry, etc. So what can we do about all of this? I had a few modest suggestions here for what we can do as individuals and as countries as a whole. One is support democratic norms here at home. Uh, remind people that we are a democracy, despite what some people say, and I hope we remain one. We need to uh, look at our elections as being fair, unless there is serious, serious evidence of vote fraud, and there really hasn't been any recent American election. Our elections are free and fair. And people have to get used to losing, and sometimes that happens, right? Your political party is not going to win every important election that you care about. Secondly, support democratic nations under outside attack. Ukraine would be the obvious example of that right now. When democratic nations are threatened by authoritarian states, I think the democratic nations of the world need to rally around them. We're talking about Ukraine right here. You could also talk about Taiwan. Taiwan is a nation... Uh, the Chinese government wouldn't like me describing it that way, but it's a nation off the coast of China, an island nation. It's, a, it's one of the most democratic regimes in the world. It has a flourishing economy, and it is regularly threatened with invasion from mainland China. And the United States needs to do all it can to support the independent democratic state of Taiwan. And lastly, encourage democratic reforms in authoritarian countries through culture and economic pressure. 
I think that democratic countries in the world can do a lot to help engender democracy in places where it doesn't exist right now. And these would include things like culturally. One thing with the internet, and places like Russia and China have been fairly effective at blocking internet access, but that's kind of a, that's not a perfect system. There's a lot of things we can do to spread ideas regarding freedom, regarding the right of people to take part in their own government, that we can spread to these countries culturally speaking. The internet would be a key way to do that. And economic pressure. Saudi Arabia is one of the least free countries on the planet. The House of Saud, the royal family there still controls the nation with no democratic input at all and engages in gross human rights violations. I understand Saudi Arabia has a lot of really cheap oil, that's attractive, but I think we could doing, be, we as Americans could be doing a lot more to put economic pressure on the Saudi government to improve the rights of their citizens. I would actually, if I had my druthers, I would like to see a system where we put tariffs on all authoritarian nations. They don't get full open trade. Uh, free of tariffs or taxation from us unless they respect democratic values. We, unfortunately, I think should see this as something like another Cold War going on right now in the world. The Soviet Union's gone, but the authoritarian governments are still there. And democratic nations should probably not pretend to be the friend of authoritarian regimes because we have diametrically opposed views on how government should be run and how the human rights of citizens should be respected. All right, that's what I had to say. I'd like to turn it over to uh, uh, students now, or faculty, who have any questions. We can talk about those. What are your questions here about democracy, about authoritarianism, about what's going on in the world right now with the two? Yeah, Paul. Could you explain um, what exactly the concerns are? Could you explain what exactly the concerns are with giving too much direct aid to Ukraine? Because you know, you're trying to fight the Russian advances yeah. there. Given the state of the Russian military right now, if the United States wanted to, it could send a couple of divisions of American troops and probably route the entire Russian army from Ukraine in a couple of days. Vladimir Putin knows that. This thing with Ukraine is a, little, is a little touchy. The Ukrainian government is being careful about how they do things in that Russia has a nuclear arsenal of several thousand weapons. And there's a fear that if Russia feels like its back is against the wall, if Vladimir Putin feels like he might be kicked out of power in some kind of coup within Russia because he's lost popularity because of this war, he might resort to using nuclear weapons to try to win the war. So if American troops were pushing up to the Russian border, they pushed all the troops out, there is a chance that Vladimir Putin could drop a small nuclear weapon on those advancing American troops. One scenario I've heard is that if the war keeps going really badly for Russia, they could high detonate a nuclear weapon a couple of hundred miles above uh, the center of Ukraine. What that does is it sends out an electromagnetic pulse and it fries all your electronics. That would temporarily send Ukraine back to, you know, 19, or late 1900s level technology. They couldn't use any of their computers. Everything would be fried out. And so I understand the United States government's position there. That's also why Ukraine has missile capacity now to hit targets inside Russia. For mo the most part, they are not. Because, once again, the unspoken rules here is the war stays contained to Ukraine. Nobody but Ukrainian or Russian forces will be directly involved. And in return for that unspoken agreement, Vladimir Putin doesn't use weapons of mass destruction in Ukraine. More questions? Yes. Who's got a question? I can put you on the mic. It's your chance for fame. They're going to put this on YouTube and everything. Here we go. Huh? Is that a yawn stretch, or are you asking? You've got a question. All right. I guess kind of going off the slide and like what we can do yeah. with people being like in their heads about like their political stance, how are we supposed to change it whenever the minority, like if we are a minority of wanting to change, how are we supposed to get anything out there? Because people are so stuck in their heads these days. Make sure I understand your question correctly. You're asking how minority groups can, uh, can get more rights and advance our culture when they're a minority within a democratic state that the majority is not going to listen to them. Start in like a smaller group. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, how do minority groups within a democratic nation get what they want? Traditionally, this has been done through appealing to the majority sense of morality. Think of like the civil rights struggle, right? In the 1950s and 60s, African American persons were 
between 10 and 15% of the American population? How are they going to get any rights? Why should white people care? What they did in the brilliance of the civil rights movement was they put direct pressure on the southern governments, the southern state governments to end their segregationist policies. And at the same time, they did it away nonviolently that gained the respect and the sympathy of white people in the north, particularly. And that's when you started to see the US government really doing something about civil rights. They made a moral appeal. Look, we're being denied the basic freedoms that we deserve as Americans. And look, when we go out and protest, we get attacked by police dogs and fire hoses. People, a lot of people outside the Deep South, and I'm sure even a lot of white Southerners themselves were disgusted by these tactics. And it became a moral concern. Look at gay rights as well, right? Gay persons, depending on how you define the term, 5 to 10% of the population. How do you get the majority of heterosexual Americans to agree to more rights for gay people? Well, you do a campaign in, in the military, since they call this a campaign of hearts and minds. Right? You reach out to straight Americans and say, look, we deserve the same rights that everybody else deserves. We deserve the right to marry. We deserve the right not to be fired from our job because of our sexual orientation. And by successfully appealing to this sense of morality of the majority of Americans, uh, the gay rights movement has made tremendous strides in the US. That'd be my answer to that. More questions. Who else? Gabe, maybe yeah. while we wait for another student question, could you comment on the quality of democracy in America right now? There's yeah. a, there's a, Saint, uh, there's a Sunday New York Times cover story that came out yesterday about the twin threats to democracy in America, the refusal to accept the results of an election and uh, a counter-majorian dimension to our democracy where yeah. public opinion is, says one thing but laws say another. Yeah, there's a lot going on there. Part of the thing with government not being responsive to the will of the majority a lot of times is that we just have two political parties. You have to be one, you have to be the other. I think when you look at this marijuana legalization referendum that's coming up on the ballot this November, you all know about that, right? Do you hear about that? You know, you could go out and vote on whether or not you want uh, recreational marijuana to be legal in this state. All right. The reason the Missouri State Legislature hasn't moved on this, even though I, I feel reasonably sure the majority of Missourians want to legalize recreational marijuana, is because the Republican Party, for various reasons, appealing to older conservatives, doesn't support it. Most people who vote Republican do so based on issues like immigration, like um, conservative social values in other areas, perhaps abortion. So because we have this two-party system, you have to vote one, you have to vote for the other, um, government a lot of times won't do exactly what the majority of Americans want. Most Americans want a higher minimum wage, and that's just something governments, the US government has just refused to do. Um, the Republican Party has some economic reasons not to support that. And as far as a decline, Michael, remind me, uh, what was the other part of your question was? The refusal to accept the results yeah. of an election. Yeah, this gets into what they, they refer to sometimes, this is what, when, when one side starts to see the other side as an existential threat. Existential refers to existence. So the idea is that the other party wins, it's literally a threat to my existence. And you see this not just on the right, but also on the left as well. A lot of, uh, especially people with uh, uh, real leftist views in the US are starting to see the Republican Party as being an existential threat to them. Right? What they perceive as the homophobia and racism of the Republican Party is an existential threat to us. Republicans, a lot of times, see Democratic politicians as existential threats to their way of life. They want to flood our country with immigrants. This would be according to their way of thinking. They want to flood our country with immigrants. They want to radically change our culture in ways I really don't want. They want to destroy our way of life. One of the real downsides of seeing your political opponents as an existential threat to you is you really can't tolerate losing. We can't let the Democrats win. They're going to destroy our way of life. We can't let the Republicans win, right? They're going to bring back slavery and reestablish segregation in this country. Whether or not those things are true, if that's what you feel, you're going to have a real hard time accepting losing. And I wish I had a better answer to this. I don't know how to reduce the tension between liberals and conservatives to where we could sit down, talk to each other, and work out compromises, which is how democracy is ideally supposed to work. But I, I wish I had a more encouraging solution to that. Uh, I don't. We need to find some way to turn down the animosity between the two major political parties and two major ideologies in the United States. All right, who's got a question? There we go. And by the way, there's someone sitting out the door uh, of this auditorium who can register people to vote. <laughs> 
So voter registration can happen in seconds, and it can happen right after this session if you want it. All right. Um, how should democracies balance, you know, doing the three things you have up there to encourage democratic norms and improve democracy mm -hmm. with short-term goals like finding more energy for Europe in the coming winter crisis and stuff like that? How, what, do you have any ideas or guidelines for how they should balance those competing goals? I'm sorry, so the competing goals was once you said like the energy crisis in Europe. For example, you need oil for Europe, you need energy for Europe, you're going to like Saudi Arabia, you get that oil. Yeah. Yeah. Easier, yeah, easier said than done. I said, you know, we, we should not treat Saudi Arabia so friendly. Well, they do have a lot of oil and a lot of, of, of fossil fuels, and Europe might need those right now because they're not buying them from Russia right now. How do you fix that? Good question. I've said, uh, as far as just that one issue goes, environmentally speaking, clean energy makes a lot of sense because it's better for the environment. Secondly, I've always thought this is a good way to sell clean energy to conservatives. This weans us off dependence from foreign oil and foreign gas, right? If we have our own renewable energy sources that we can use here in the U.S. or in Western Europe, the Western European nations, they have their own renewable energy sources. They don't need Russia anymore. They don't need Saudi Arabia, these autocratic regimes that have large oil reserves. Uh, so I see it as a national security issue as well, and one to forward human rights as well as being just good for the environment, which is the primary thing for a lot of people. But that's the thing we need to push towards. In the short term, you're right, it's not so easily done. We don't have... Uh, uh, renewable energy sources right now in the U.S. or other countries that could just take the place of natural gas or coal or oil. What do you do about that in the short term? Yes, you probably have to deal with these countries at least a little bit, but maybe have the attitude more, listen, we're going to put some tariffs on you, and we're doing this because we need this from you, not because we're friendly to your government. There's a difference there. Any other questions? Excellent questions we're getting. Yeah. Hi. Um, in reference to the government's not being responsive to the majority of the voters, mm -hmm. um, we haven't really talked about the influence of maybe dark money on politics. What are, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, the effect of money on politics. There was a, a Supreme Court decision in 2010 called the Citizens United case, and it said that corporate interests and wealthy individuals have the right to run ads, say, on television, uh, on the internet. They don't have to say where they're getting their funding from. This is a First Amendment thing. People have a First Amendment free speech right and freedom of press right to do that. And a lot of people found that really disturbing. I think it can be a, a factor. Wealthier people's views are much more represented in government than those of poorer people. There's a couple of reasons for that. That's unfortunately a truth in just about any democracy and really any government in the world. Sometimes I think the, the influence of money can be a little bit overblown. When they've done studies on this, they found that if I'm a candidate running for office and I raise two or three times the amount of money of my opponent, it probably won't help me more than one or two percentage points in the final vote. Now, those one or two percent could be important if it's a close election, but I've always told people if money just means you win an election, then why wasn't Michael Bloomberg the Democratic nominee in 2016? He's a billionaire who plowed tremendous amounts of money into that election. He didn't get the Democratic nomination. I'm just saying money isn't everything. It is a factor, though. More questions? Yeah, we got one down in the corner. So you said we should try to spread uh, Democratic values into mm -hmm. more authoritarian nations. So what do you say to like nations like China, North Korea, to where people are brainwashed from the day they're born up and they have a fear of speaking out and don't have the right to assemble and things such as that. Like, how do you go about spreading information there? Once again, not easy, right? North Korea is going to be a tough one. In North Korea, they've executed people for having DVD copies of Squid Game. If you guys know about it, it's a Korean TV made in South Korea. You're not ever allowed to show movies or TV shows made in South Korea in North Korea because those movies and TV shows show how much better everything is. You get the idea how much more advanced their culture is. Yeah, North Korea is going to be a tough nut to crack. Would that, I would go, to, to change things in North Korea, you probably need the help of China, which is going to be difficult right now. But um, uh, as long as China keeps supplying uh, North Korea with the economic backing that it needs, it's going to be difficult in that country to achieve much. In China, even, there are some cracks in the Chinese censorship system. Western movies are very popular in China. Right? And through those, you can almost subtly put in um, uh, uh, statements regarding human freedom, regarding the freedom of speech. You can kind of work those into your films and your TV shows without making them obvious. But I really think there is a potential there. 
in countries like China to influence them culturally through Western culture, uh, through democratic culture, I really should say. But yeah, North Korea is going to be a tough one. No, I agree with that. No, I, I don't have a quick or easy solution to that one. Does somebody else have their hand up over here? I thought I may have saw another hand. Come on, people, this is your chance. <laughs> Ask the man. We've got one over here, Michael, I think, on this side. Okay. I don't see, the, see that hand high. There we go. You mentioned the relationship between the United States and Taiwan. So yeah. do you think that we continue to defend them because of their ideology being democratic, or do you think we care so much because of their economy and what they have to offer uh, well, like in technology? The great thing about democratic capitalism is you can do both, right? Hey, you're a democratic regime, so we're friendly towards you that, and we'll definitely buy your stuff, right? So yeah, the, Taiwan is also has a really vibrant economy. Um, and so I think, I think both those things can be true at once. The United States values Taiwan economically. I really think the United States, I mean, Joe Biden and a lot of other people in the US government seem to generally just support Taiwan on also just ideological levels. You know, They see Taiwan as kind of being a bastion of, of democratic free government there right next to a large authoritarian, totalitarian state in China. So I think it's a bit of both going on there. Any more questions? I'm impressed, Gabe, with the quality of the questions that we're getting this yeah. morning. As am I. These are thought-provoking questions. Okay. Coming up. So, I guess, um, like, do you think democratic values are like, inherent to, like, I guess, the human mind, like, how, they, how people, like, think? Probably not. Um, when human beings existed on a tribal level in like Neolithic times, you had um, uh, a lot of times a council of elders or maybe a chief basically ran the tribe. I think America, uh, Americans, human beings in general tend to be hierarchical, you know, in the way they look at things. But I'll point out, just because something isn't natural doesn't necessarily mean it's not good. And I think democracy is good with the world as complex as we are today. We kind of need democracy. I feel to run governments effectively. But one of the reasons I think this is, an, I never thought of it quite this way before, but maybe one of the reasons democracy struggles in a lot of the areas of the world is that we're not historically used to thinking like this, right? That everybody should have an equal say on how our government is run and how it operates. But that definitely means we, sh that doesn't mean we should not try to do so. Like I said, with the complexity of the world we have today, the complexity of government, we need everybody's input on it in a way that ancient people would not have. One from the back. Hold on. I'll devil do it. Um, I just, uh, as the uh, faculty advisor for the su Students for Sensible Drug Policy, I wanted to hit on the, the direct democracy that's going to happen in about, a month, about six weeks mm -hmm. in Missouri. So if you want to talk about, you know, obviously the issue is legalization, full, le full legalization of marijuana, but would you talk about exactly how that you know, how students could actually themselves directly vote on an issue and how that's, while yeah. we are an indirect democracy, for the most part, we do have instances of direct democracy. Mm -hmm. Under the Missouri Constitution, if you collect a couple of hundred thousand signatures, you could put a question on the ballot and you can change state law or our state constitution through a direct vote of the people. So this, like Paul just said, is an example of like direct democracy. The people are gonna directly make a decision in government. So this November, this is on the ballot. Um, there were some challenges to it, but the Missouri Supreme Court just affirmed that this ballot proposal is going to appear on the November ballot. And it's going to be for legalizing recreational marijuana here in Missouri. We already have medical marijuana legalized in this state. Illinois has recreational marijuana legalization. You may well know that. But this would change the laws here in Missouri. So there's a couple of things you can do as students right now. And this is what, however you feel about this issue. Younger people tend to be pretty strongly in support of marijuana legalization, but I don't doubt there might be a couple of people in this room who are not so crazy about this idea. That's okay too, absolutely. So there's a couple of things you can do. One, you can donate money. I've done that a little bit myself on this ballot issue. You could donate money, right, and try to get this thing passed or try to get it stopped. You go out and volunteer. It, well, at the very least, you could go out and tell your friends about it. Hey, it's really important you show up to vote this November if you feel importantly about this issue, feel this is a, uh, an important issue. Try to encourage people to go out and vote. You could volunteer 
you know, go out and knock on, literally sometimes they have people knocking on doors, you know, saying, hey, this is on the ballot in November, this is what it does, it's really important, we really hope you come out and vote for it, or we hope you vote against it. And, of course, the most important thing is actually show up and vote in the first Tuesday in November, right, when we have the election. This is going to be on the ballot. People can directly decide this. We'll see what happens here in Missouri. In every state in recent years where they've had a marijuana legalization uh, uh, bill voted on by the people, they've always passed. Now, Missouri could be the exception. Missouri is a fairly conservative state. But I tend to think the momentum is probably with that side of it. More questions. These have been really good questions. Well, if we feel like everybody, like you've learned enough about democracy and dictatorship, I think we're good here, unless anybody has anything else they'd like to add. All right. Thanks for coming out, everybody. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Hope Thank you, you Gabe. Day. Thanks, everybody, for coming. And uh, just one last reminder, voter registration is a must, and you could do it here if you wish, right outside these doors. <laughs>